church. How are we feeling this morning? Would you stand on up? We're going to lift up the name of Jesus in this place together. Come on, let's get our hands going through this. church something happens when we lift up the name of Jesus we put our eyes on him we praise him the name above every other name so come on we see Good morning, Woodlands Church. We're so glad that you're here with us. Turn around and say hello to somebody next to you. Give my five handshake. Say, welcome to church. You got an extra hour of sleep. You should feel rested, ready to go, right? You may be seated at this time. My name is Chris Van Houten. I'm our lead pastor of Life Groups, and I'm so glad that you are here with us. It is a great weekend to be in church. We have a great service planned for you. Um, if you have a little one and you have not yet taken them over to our WC Kids, whether that's preschool or WC Kids Ministry, they are an incredible experience over there for tailored specifically for your little ones. So make sure that you take them over there. It is absolutely a great experience just for them. And if you have not yet downloaded the Woodlands Church app, make sure you do that as well. Two things we wanna make sure you always know before you even start service, right? You gotta know the message notes are on the Woodlands Church app. If you wanna hear not only the songs in which we play on the weekend that we worship together with, uh, Woodlands Worship also just came out with a brand new song called Winds, The Winds and the Waves. And so that is now available. And so you can actually listen to all those on all streaming platforms, Spotify, Apple Music, all of the above. So uh, make sure you have the Woodlands Church app though so that you can stay connected with all the events and things happening here at Woodlands Church because we have a lot of great things happening. So first, 
Next weekend is our 30th anniversary as a church. It is gonna be an incredible celebration of all that God has done over the last 30 years. I mean, yeah, you can clap for that. That's incredible, right? Um, but we're also believing for the next 30 years and trusting God with what that looks like to continue to build upon that. That's why we are in the series, Believe and Build. And so um, more than anything, make sure you're not only here next weekend to celebrate all the incredible life change moments, the miracles, the wonderful things that God has done over the last 30 years. But if you know somebody that doesn't have a church home, then invite them in because they need to be a part of the next 30 years as to what God is gonna continue to do in this place. Um, and then we also have an event uh, that is happened before. If you have been a part of it, it is a little bit different this year. Festival of Lights is coming up. November 24th is the first night that we are open for Festival of Lights. Um, it will run through the end of December. It is an incredible experience. If you've been before last year or the year before that, um, we will still have the free experience out on the plaza with the music synced up with lights. Um, but we also have partnered with the, the organization, the company that does Zoo Lights. And so they're actually doing above and beyond. It's gonna be an incredible experience to walk through on campus and it's gonna take up most of our campus. So uh, that is an actual uh, charged ticket. So if you wanna get your tickets and reserve your spot to be a part of it, those tickets are $10. Kids four and under are free. Um, and if you're sitting here thinking, oh wait, what, $10? You can volunteer for free, let me tell you, okay? I'm just saying, that is available to you. All right, um, so once you go on there, you can check out tickets and times. Um, but really our goal is to make sure that our community comes and hears the true story of Christmas, that they hear about Jesus's birth, that they get invited back to the Christmas Eve services because that's what our hope is, that we want people to experience Christ here at Woodlands Church. And so our hope is that as many people in the community that will come and be a part of this incredible Christmas light experience is all also the same group of people that will come maybe for the very first time to Christmas Eve services and hear the gospel and be forever changed and different because of it. And so I hope you'll invite people. You hope you'll spread the word that Festival of Lights is coming. It's gonna be an incredible time, um, but we wanna make sure they have a great experience. So come serve at it. It's gonna be a great opportunity to love our community and help them know truly uh, the true meaning of Christmas. And so again, sign up online to be a volunteer or get your tickets online. Um, but last, I wanna make sure that you know, not only we're in the series, Believe and Build, but Pastor Kerry has a powerful message all about raising giant killers. And I have three little giant killer toddlers right now in my home. And we are trying to raise up the next generation, what it means to stand together in Christ on a firm foundation. So if you would, let's continue to worship together and prepare our, our hearts for what God is gonna do today. Let's worship.
Jesus, we just worship you this morning. God, it's good to remember that when we do take you at your word, God, we end up being awestruck by your goodness every single time, your faithfulness, God. We just lift our praise to you this morning. Come on. Before I was four, you knew my name. Was held in your hand, still today. You know me better than anyone could. From the moment I arrived through the night, sing over me, breathe new life. No hesitation, you're always waiting. I'm more struck and wonder.
it all right if we continue to testify of his goodness?
celebrating the goodness of God because God is so good. Why do I forget it so often? And if something difficult, something painful comes into my life and I forget about how good God is and how good He's always been to me. God is good and I'm telling you He has good plans for you. But we have to focus on Him. That's when we come to church, isn't it? We get our eyes off God during the week at times and our problems become so big and all we see are the giants that we're facing and you come to church and those giants, they get a lot smaller because worship is focusing on God. You focus on God, your problems get a lot smaller. Everything starts to come into perspective. Worship is all about a true perspective. And so I want us just to celebrate God's goodness. And then I want us to expect God to do something good and powerful and fresh in our lives. I believe with all my heart that whether you're worshiping with us online or you're right here at the Woodlands campus, or you're out there at Atascacita or Atascacita campus with Pastor Daniel, who's amazing, I know God knows where you're at and He wants to speak to you today. He wants to do something good in your life. He's already doing something good in your life and He wants you to recognize it. But I know that He has something new for you today. I believe with all my heart today is a life-changing day. God's been working at Wilderness Church this weekend and He wants you to know that He is real. Wilderness Church is here so people can know that God is real. Not only is he real, but he knows who you are. He created you. Not only does he know who you are and what you're going through, but he cares. He's not a God out there in the cosmos somewhere who created it all, and, but he doesn't really care. He's just, hey, just go at it. You know, make the best of it. I'm too busy doing things that are important. Just live your life. No, he doesn't do that. He cares. But he's not just some kindly grandfather out in the cosmos who really cares, but he can't do anything about your problems. No, he has the power to change it. He has the power to change your life. He has the power to destroy any barrier you're facing. Our God knows what you're going through. He cares about it, and he has the power to change it. So let's pray to him right now. Dear God, we thank you that we pray to you because you're the only one who's worthy of our praise and our prayers. You're the only one that can really do something in our lives that makes a difference for all eternity. And so, Lord, we come before you today because we know that you know what we're going through. You know everyone's problems and pain and difficulties and struggles. And, Lord, you care. You care so much. You care about every detail of our lives. And, Lord, I know not only do you know and do you care, but you have the power to change the situation. You have the power to work a miracle in the next few moments. And we pray you do that in Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. I get to talk this weekend about something Chris and I are so passionate about. In fact, it's really our life's passion. And that is to live our lives and to live out our faith in such a way that our kids and their kids see that God is real and they wanna follow Christ because they see that our faith is genuine and real. And they see in our lives, in our everyday life, that hey, God's real. And God cares about everything in our lives. That God cares about the ordinary things in our lives. God cares about our eternity. God cares about our schedules. God is real. And so that's really our life's passion, is to live our life in such a way that our kids see our faith is real and wanna follow Jesus and our grandkids see that their faith is real and wanna follow Jesus, and that generations follow Jesus. Now, it's only because of God's grace, because as parents and grandparents, we make all kinds of mistakes, still do, but it's God's grace and his mercy, but that's our life prayer, and that is our life passion. And that's why at Woodlands Church, one of our greatest passions is to see this next generation coming up seeing that our faith is real and genuine and building into them so that they can be raised up to follow Christ with all their hearts and change the world. That's our passion at Woodland Church, to raise up this next generation in Jesus Christ, to stand against all the peer pressure and all the things that our culture brings against them and follow Jesus with their whole heart. That's why we invest so much and that's why we do so much for our children and students, teenagers and young adults, because we wanna build this generation to change the world. 
And so I want us to look at one verse. It's a really short verse, but it is a haunting verse. This verse haunts me. I mean, this verse is a scary verse. So I want you to stand and just follow along with me. It's Judges chapter 2, verse 10. It says, after that whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. That's a haunting verse because it says that after this great God-loving generation, you know, died out, the next generation that grew up didn't know God or follow God. It's one of the saddest verses in all of scripture. You can be seated because I've got some good news for you. We're starting on a sad note, but we're gonna end on an exciting, joyful, powerful note because God wants this generation to change the world. Now, I'm talking about Joshua's generation. Joshua, the great leader who led God's people into the promised land. And it says, after Joshua and his generation of God followers died off, the next generation grew up not knowing God and not following God. Joshua's generation was the one that, saw God knock down the walls of Jericho so they could defeat the city of Jericho. Joshua's generation saw God split the Jordan River in two when it was at flood stage so they could enter the promised land. Joshua's generation saw miracle after miracle after miracle and yet their kids, the very next generation, grew up not knowing or following God. Somehow Joshua's generation of all the good things they did didn't do the most important thing. They didn't pass on their faith. They dropped the baton somehow. And this is a stark reminder to me that Christianity is only one generation away from extinction. Did you get that? Christianity is only one generation away from extinction. If we don't pass our faith on to our kids, if we don't live out a genuine faith that they want to follow, if we drop the baton, Christianity is extinct in one generation. It's over, it's history. The generation that Joshua led into the promised land, they were the giant killer generation. I mean, these guys loved God and followed God. See, the generation before them was afraid to go into the promised land because they said, they're giants in the land. They stood at the doorstep of their destiny and then they sent the spies in to check it out and they said, hey, the land God promised us is amazing, but they're giant warriors in the land. These armies are too big for us. And so they shrunk back in fear. And now 40 years later, Joshua leads a new generation of Israelites into the promised land. The same giant warring tribes are still there, but Joshua leads this generation to see that their God is bigger than any giant and that God had made them to be giant killers. They were called to be giant killers. And with God's power, that generation entered the promised land and conquered the giants. They were the giant killer generation. But the very next generation grows up not following God. Why? Well, there were still giants in the land all around them. There were all these giant cultural influences from the idol worshipers around them that were deadly to the faith of the generation after Joshua. I don't think the parents of Joshua's generation recognized how devastating those giants were. Now they recognized when they were facing giant warriors, they were out to kill them. They knew, hey, we're giant killers with God's power. But they didn't recognize that their kids were facing greater giants trying to destroy their faith. And I really believe Joshua's generation failed to train their children to be giant killers. I think they didn't see the need for their children to be giant killers. And I believe we stand at the most critical defining moment in our nation's history. We stand at a spiritual crossroads. The American Survey Center did a survey of Gen Z. Gen Z is the teenagers today up through early 20s. And they found that this generation coming up is the least religious generation in American history. That means the fastest growing religion in the US is no religion. Only 35% of them say faith is an important part of their life, faith of any kind. Only 20% say the Bible is the word of God. You see, there's a battle going on for the soul of this next generation. And there's some giants that are coming against them and we better realize that they're facing, with, facing giants that want to destroy their faith. You see, their secularism is our culture 
becomes more and more a secular culture, and secularism feeds the giant of hopelessness. There are these powerful forces of secularism today. Those are the voices that say God has no place in the public square and just be quiet about your faith. It's offensive. But secularism leaves a giant vacuum that is filled quickly by hopelessness. I mean, you take God out of the equation, and what's the point? There is no hope. If we're just here by accident, then why get up in the morning? There's no point to life. If all this is a random accident and there is no God, then there is no hope. Everything is hopeless, everything is meaningless. And we have a whole generation of young people growing up who are filled with hopelessness that don't know that God made them for a purpose, that don't understand what the meaning of life is, and they feel meaningless. But then there's materialism, and that feeds the giant of purposelessness in a huge way. This powerful force of materialism, it's the voices that tell our kids, the more you have, the happier you'll be, because your net worth equals your self-worth. And those voices of materialism feed this giant of purposelessness, and it keeps growing because, hey, if there's really no purpose, maybe I'll just do what I wanna do, try to make some money, try to be successful. Uh, try to collect some things, try to be famous, try to get the applause of other people. And it just is a purposeless life because if you're not living your own only life for something that's greater than you are, for something that is eternal, then you're missing out on your purpose. But then there's hedonism. Hedonism feeds the giant of emptiness. There's this powerful force of hedonism. Now, hedonism is a age old philosophy, it's that philosophy that says eat, drink and be merry for tomorrow we die. Since there's no point, then just do what you wanna do. You know, just live for pleasure, live for yourself. But hedonism just leaves this giant emptiness in the soul. And people growing up today say, well, this is my truth, I'm just gonna do what I feel is best. I'm gonna follow my truth. I'm gonna do what I feel, I'm gonna love everybody and just do what I feel like I'm going to do, I'm gonna love everybody except for someone who tells me I shouldn't do what I'm doing and I'm not gonna love them. But in this defining moment, we stand face to face with the giants of hopelessness, purposelessness and emptiness that are trying to destroy the faith of this generation. And all I can say is there's only one person who can change that. There's only one person who can stand against that and that's you. All throughout history, We've seen how one ordinary person can take their stand in a defining moment and it changes the course of history. Just as Rosa Parks took her seat instead of her stand and it started the civil rights movement. We see over and over and over again throughout history and all the way through the scripture that when one person takes their stand and steps up, to believe God and do what they know in their heart is right. God used it to change history. We're looking at scripture today at a young teenager, ordinary teenager named David, who takes his stand and kills the giant that his nation is facing and it changes the course of history. He changed his destiny because your destiny is determined by where you stand in the defining moments of your life. And David, the scripture tells us, was just an ordinary teenager. He wasn't a warrior. He was just supposed to come to the front lines to bring lunch to his brothers. But the Philistine army and the Israelite army had gathered in the Valley of Elah. In fact, I have been to the Valley of Elah um, several times. And every time I go to the Valley of Elah, I always get a smooth stone out of the dry riverbed that's there. I get that smooth stone, you know, to, to remind me to be a giant killer. And I've lost every one of them when I get home. So I just replace them with a landscaping rock in my yard and just pretend like, This is the real deal. And I think too that they're just bringing truckloads in for the tourists over there. That's what they're doing. You know, like you see truck come in and replacing all those rocks. Well, they're taking all the rocks out of the river, you know, so. um, But the Valley of Eli is a real place and this battle really took place. And both armies were getting ready to attack. And just before the attack, this giant steps forward from the Philistine lines, a gargantuan of a man. The Bible says he was nine feet, six inches tall. And Goliath steps forward and he issues a challenge to the Israelite army. And he says, you send out your best warrior and I'll face him in the ultimate cage match. And Goliath sends out this challenge. 
He says, if you defeat me, then our Philistine army will surrender to you. If I kill your best man, then you, the Israelite army, must surrender to us and be our slaves. Now, King Saul, who stood head and shoulders above everyone else, should have been the one to face Goliath. But he had missed his defining moment a long time ago. He missed his moment. He missed his miracle. He had long since shrunk back in fear rather than stepping forward in faith. And so there was no leadership in the army at the time. And everyone on the front lines was looking to see what they were supposed to do next. Everyone was confused and they retreated in confusion because there was no leadership. And this generation growing up is a confused generation. They have so many voices coming at them and telling them how to live their life. And this is what you do. And this is how you, you follow others. And this is how we all conform to the culture and, and the pressure is there in such a great way. But it's a confused generation because once you give up the foundation of God's word and there's no foundation and say, well, whatever's true is what's true for you. You do whatever you feel like, that's your truth. Well, then there's no solid foundation and everything gets confusing. But David was sent by his dad to bring supplies to his older brothers. And as he's coming to the front lines, the army was retreating in confusion. And David is like, where's everyone going? I thought the battle was up ahead. And he grabs someone and he says, what's going on? And they say, haven't you heard? There's a giant in the Philistine camp. We've never seen anything like this guy. He's challenging us to send out our best fighter to face him in man-to-man, -man, hand hand-to-hand fight to the death combat. And there's no one who can stand up to him. And we don't know what to do. And David decided right then and there that he would stand up to the giant. It's hard to believe. Just an ordinary teenager would have that kind of courage. He wasn't part of the confused generation. He was gonna lead the courageous generation. I love that. He says, I've got a great God, and I'm gonna step up. I'll take that on. While everyone else saw Goliath as a giant problem, David saw Goliath as a giant opportunity to bring hope to a whole nation. It was all because he had this healthy perspective on God. He had a healthy perspective on the greatness of his God. And because he had this healthy perspective on the greatness of his God, he looked at life from a God level. He had a God level perspective. Most people have a ground level perspective, but he had a God level perspective. And from a God level perspective, Goliath looked like a little ant to God. And David knew his God was the true giant. And his God could take down any earthly giant. And so David said, I I'm gonna take my stand. And that's why I'm so excited to be alive in this defining critical moment of all history. As we look out and we see all these giant problems, what I see is a giant opportunity to take our stand and change the world. A giant opportunity to take our stand against the giants of our day is ordinary people trusting an extraordinary God. I look at it from a God level perspective and I just thank the Lord God that I get to be alive during this time. I thank God that I have kids who are now adults in this time and they have grandkids that are growing up during this critical, chaotic, crazy time. I am so grateful for that. You know, so many people I know say, oh, it's so terrible, our kids growing up, I don't know what's gonna happen to them, this next generation, next generation. I mean, it's awful, it's just getting worse. Everything's awful, everything's horrible. That's a ground level perspective. What I see is the giant problems we face today are really just giant opportunities to take our stand and let our great God change the world through ordinary people like you and me. That's what it's all about. There is no doubt that this generation coming up is facing greater giants than ever before and the enemy is determined to extinguish their faith. Without a doubt, if we don't do anything about it, that's what will happen. But here's the thing. We're raising giant killers at Woodlands Church. We're raising giant killers in a culture that's filled with giants that kill. And we're gonna raise them up to slay the giants. That's what it's all about. And as we celebrate our 30th anniversary as a church this next weekend, we're gonna celebrate. It's gonna be like a Christmas Eve, all these creative things planned. I hope you'll invite friends. It's gonna be an exciting time, but I really believe we stand at a defining moment in our church and I can't wait to take our stand
so that we can change the world with God's power. This next generation is the key. Either Christianity will become extinct or they will become giant killers that we raise up to bring revival to this world. It's already happening around the world. We've got thousands of Davids at this church. We have thousands of young people, children, teenagers, students who are slaying the giant of hopelessness because they place their faith in Jesus Christ, our only hope. And they're filled with hope and they're giving their life away. They're not living for pleasure. They're giving their life away to make an impact. And I believe with all my heart, this generation is going to change the world. Do you believe that, Wilson Church? <laughs> Never feel sorry for raising giant killers in a culture filled with giants. I just see what God is doing here at Wilson Church and it's so unique as this generation coming up is turning away from faith, at Woodland Church, we see just the opposite. We see all these kids, all these students coming to faith in Christ, not only coming to faith, but stepping up to be leaders, believing God's word is true and saying, you know what? I'm just gonna believe it and I'm gonna step out in faith. And they're finding they have a God who wants to do great things through them. I believe with all my heart, this generation is going to change the world. I really do because I see thousands of Davids here at Woodland Church. We're raising them up to be giant killers in a culture filled with killing giants that are out to kill their faith. And I'm so excited that we get to be alive at this historical hinge point in all of history. And we see that God wants to do something amazing through ordinary people. And if we don't take our stand and step up at this time, realizing that this generation is facing giants that are trying to destroy their faith, then that's exactly what will happen. But when you take your stand in the defining moments of life, and by the way, I think most individuals have maybe three or four defining moments in their whole life, and it really determines their whole destiny. It's those historical hinge points where you come to this place where if you take one step forward in faith, you go to a whole nother level, it changes your destiny. But if you shrink back in fear and take a step back in fear, it changes your destiny. It's like the people of Israel, the generation that was on the doorstep of their destiny, getting ready to go in the promised land. But then when the spies, 10 of them that came out said, oh, we can't take those guys, they're giant. The land's amazing, but we can't do it. They took one step back and guess what? God allowed that step to be 40 years in the wilderness and all that generation died out in the desert before Joshua led the new generation of giant killers into the promised land. You see, we have... I know in my life, I've had three or four defining moments where I could have stepped forward in faith or stepped back in fear. And I'm so grateful God has allowed me in his grace to take a little step forward in faith even when I'm afraid. And it's taken me to new levels. God has a destiny for each one of us. If you've missed your defining moment so far, I know he's got one left. I know he's got one left. You wouldn't be alive if you didn't have a defining moment left in your life. They can take you to a whole new level. We see that God wants to do something amazing through ordinary people like you and me. And when King David, who would be later King David, came to King Saul, David, a little shepherd boy, comes to King Saul and says, I'm gonna fight this giant. And so King Saul, who should have been fighting, he brings David in to see him and he talks to him. And here's what David says in 1 Samuel 17. Don't worry about this Philistine, David told him. I'll go fight him. Don't be ridiculous, Saul replied. There's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy and he's been a man of war since his youth. But David persisted. I've been taking care of my father's sheep and goats, he said. When a lion or a bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club and rescue the lamb from its mouth. If the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and club it to death. I've done this to both lions and bears and I'll do it again to this pagan Philistine. For he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. Saul finally consented. All right, go ahead, he said, and may the Lord be with you. Saul's first response to David's faith is, don't be ridiculous. Don't be ridiculous. I mean, you're just a boy. You're ridiculous. What are you doing? Don't be ridiculous. But I would say ridiculous faith is the only kind of faith that changes destinies and changes the course of history. And that's the kind of faith it's gonna take. And that's the kind of faith God loves when we have ridiculous faith, when it's ridiculous faith in him, it's not ridiculous at all. 
Ridiculous faith is the only kind of faith that slays the giants that are in your life right now. And when you stand up for your faith, when you stand up for the greatness of God, then there are gonna be people who say to you, don't be ridiculous, you have ridiculous faith. Don't be ridiculous. Whenever you stand up and reflect the greatness of God, to choose to step out in faith, to believe him for great things in your life, there will be people who say, that's ridiculous. You see, really King Saul had a ridiculous perspective. He thought he was being sensible and David was one being ridiculous, but David had a sensible faith because he saw the truth. He saw the greatness of God. Goliath looked like a little ant running around compared to the greatness of God. But Saul, Goliath was overwhelming. It was impossible. We see Saul running from an ant. That's ridiculous. But whenever you place your faith in a great God, you step out to believe him for great things in your life and you stand up and proclaim your faith in the public square, there will be people that say, you're ridiculous but you're just being sensible. They just don't know. They just don't have the true perspective. And if we're gonna raise a generation of giant killers, we can't be afraid to stand out and reflect God's greatness. We stand out, not to stand out, but to reflect God's greatness. When you come to those defining moments, don't be afraid to stand out, but when you do stand out, you stand out reflecting the greatness of your God through your life. And you will be criticized without a doubt. Anytime you do anything with your one and only life that reflects God's greatness, it, whenever you step out as an ordinary, imperfect person to allow God to do something great through you, you're gonna be criticized without a doubt. David gets it from his own family in 1 Samuel 17, 28. But when David's oldest brother, Eliab, heard David talking like that, he was angry. What are you doing around here anyway, he demanded. What about the sheep you're supposed to be taken care of? I know what a cocky brat you are. You just wanna see the battle. So his brother accuses him of just wanting to see the blood and the gore of the battle. He says, what are you doing here anyway? You're not doing your job. You're a shepherd boy. You're not a warrior. Who do you think you are? You're just a cocky brat. You're just proud. So he questions David's motives. Now, whenever you stand out to reflect the glory of God, there'll be someone that will question your motives. There'll be someone who criticizes you because whenever you stand up, and you stand out, all the people sitting down that have missed their defining moment in their life, they're gonna criticize you and tell you to sit down because it makes them feel a lot better. Sit down, you're making me feel bad. Sit down, there are always people that will cut you down and say, who do you think you are? Why are you doing this? I mean, who do you think you are anyway? You're getting too big for your britches. Why are you standing out like that? Sit down, but don't ever be afraid to stand out for the glory of God. You don't stand out for selfish reasons today. There's so many people that just wanna stand out. In fact, this generation, well, one of their number one desires is to be unique, to stand out, to be noticed, to be different. And in that, they just become like everyone else. And they don't realize that if you're a Christ follower, you're already different. You're already unique. He made you unique for a unique purpose that no one else can fulfill and they don't understand their identity in Christ. It's not to stand out just so you can stand out and have a lot of followers and have a lot of influence and just do whatever it takes to get some influence and some followers and get famous. And because this generation thinks that, hey, that's, that'd bring happiness. It does just the opposite. You stand out for the glory of God. That's what we're called to do. It's so interesting to me that David doesn't shrink back in fact, after his older brother criticizes him and says, who do you think you are? And David just doesn't even answer him. He just turns and goes, now tell me how I can fight this guy. He didn't, I guess he was used to being criticized by his older brother because he doesn't even listen to him. He just goes on. And, and this is really important. To have courage to be a giant killer instead of being confused in a culture filled with giants, to have courage, you gotta hang around people that encourage you. This is really important. You see, David realized, I can't hang around my brother. He's bringing me down, he's discouraging me, and discourage means to take away courage, to take away courage, to take away courage, to take away courage. So if you're hanging around someone who says, I don't know why you're trying that, you can't do that. You're no good at that. You'll never be able to do that, that's impossible. What are you doing that for? If they're not your spouse, you need to get away from them. Yeah, and if they are your spouse, that's a 10-part message series that'll be coming later. So uh, 
That's gonna take me a while to break that one down. But I mean, if, if you don't have to, if they're not in your family, and you don't have to, don't hang around them. Hang around people that encourage you, that li live life from a God-level perspective, that see what God can do, that encourage you, that fill you with courage. Well, uh, David, he just keeps standing out and reflecting the glory of God. He refuses to sit down. And don't let anyone ever keep you from believing God for all that he wants you to believe him for in this life. Don't ever let anyone keep you from stepping out in faith to believe God for great things in your life because our God loves it. God loves it when his kids believe that he can do anything because he can. Nothing is impossible with God. Don't let anyone ever tell you, sit down, shut up, stop talking about your faith, stop believing God for great things. Don't be afraid to stand out and reflect the glory of your great God. If you never get criticized, it just means you're not doing anything with your one and only life that's making a difference because anytime you step out to do anything, not just for God, but anytime you step out just to do anything, you're going to get criticized. And definitely anytime you step out to do anything in God's power and God's strength for his glory, you're going to get criticized. The only people that never get criticized are those who don't do anything. They just sit on the sidelines, up in the bleachers, and just criticize everyone else but they never do anything with their one and only life and they miss their defining moment. And that's the reason why there are a lot of criticizers out there because it's people that have missed their defining moments. They sat down when they should have taken a stand and they don't want anyone else to stand up because they're bitter about it. So don't be afraid to stand out. Don't be afraid to step up and believe God for great things. When our church just began and we just had a few people I'll never forget how Chris and I would talk about our passion is to raise this next generation, to grow up in the Lord and know what, that God is real and God has a great purpose for their life. And Chris was so passionate about it. She said, I wanna make sure that, that when kids come to church, it's the best hour of their week, that church ought to be the most exciting place as they learn the values of God's word and, and the Bible stories and they learn how to fall in love with Christ and have a relationship with him. It needs to be great. So Chris was our children's pastor for the first year. We only had one service. And she did the children, she said, I'm gonna start this right. This has got to be right, because that's the most important thing, is this next generation. And so she was the children's pastor for the whole first year. And so I would preach, and it'd be like, wow, 150 people showed up today. God, what a miracle, I can't believe this. And, and four people came to Christ, this is unbelievable. And, and so then after the service, I, Chris and I would meet up, and I'd go, you won't believe what happened. I mean, it was amazing. In that little room, we could hardly get 150 people in there. And, and four people prayed to receive Christ. Oh, it's unbelievable. And she said, it was unbelievable in children's today too. <laughs> yeah, but three kids throw up, you know? <laughs> Something spreading. <laughs> and then I had five workers call me five minutes after the service started and said they wouldn't be here. I said, thank you for letting me know. You know, she said, it was awful today in children's. But she'd say, but it's so important. She didn't get to come to the church for the first year. She didn't know if the church was any good. She didn't know if she wanted to join it or not for a year. <laughs> That's how much she believed this is what is important. Finally, we went to two services. And, but that's still the way we believe. And I, and I remember how when our church, maybe 300 or so, people started asking me in the church, hey, when are we gonna get our church? When are we gonna have our church? And I go, what do you mean? I mean, we have a church. No, I mean, we did a building. And I said, well, the church is not a building. It's the body of Christ. Church is not a place you go. It's people, it's you. And so we already have a church, but we do need a building, that's for sure. This is getting kind of crazy. Um, we have a church, it's just you don't know where we're meeting next weekend. I get that, I understand that. And, and I would always say, I feel like, you know, God wants us to get at least 50 acres of land because the church is growing. We wanna have enough room for generations to come. And, and people would tell me, you don't understand, no church has ever gotten more than five acres in the woodlands. And so that's, that's the limit, five acres. And I said, well, I just, I just feel like God wants us to get more, but I never even thought much about it, didn't do anything about it. Then someone came to us and said, there's 125 acres open right in the middle of the Woodlands. A family owns it, and they're not selling it to the Woodlands Corporation, but the Woodlands owns the access around it. And the Woodlands said, if we buy the land, that'll solve everything. We have to build our own access, our roads in, it becomes part of the Woodlands. We didn't even know that land was there, but then we knew that God when he created the earth, created that 125 acres for Woodland Church to make a difference in the world. That it was God's land, he prepared it when he created the earth. 
he just finally revealed it to us. And I'll never forget how I went back to the church and I said, hey, we have an opportunity to get 125 acres. It's like $7,000 an acre, it's $800,000. I know that seems so impossible, 125 acres for our little church, but, but what do you think? And all 300 said, let's go for it. One guy even said, is that enough land? And I was like, <laughs> either you're on meds and you got off of them, or you're a man of great faith. And I'm not sure which, but I like you no matter what, because I'm gonna believe you're a man of great faith. So I was like, wow. And then I said, you know, that's great, we're all excited, but really all that counts is giving sacrificially. Because if we're going to be generation changers, we have to be generational givers and we have to make a difference. And I'm not a fundraiser, I don't know how to do fundraising. And so why don't we all pray and ask the Lord to show us what to give over and above our regular giving so that we can get this land. And then we had a banquet to tell everyone about it that was interested about the land and, and how we could possess the land. And we had this big banquet and we planned it out. And, and before the banquet, I sent our youth pastor out here to the land. And I said, I, I want you to go out there where the church land is and I want you to dig up the land we're trying to buy. I want you to dig up several bagfuls of dirt there and bring them back to the office that we're renting. And I said, I've got these vials. I want you to fill them up these vials up with dirt. We're gonna give those to everyone at the banquet so that they can hold that in their hand every day and pray for God to help us possess the land that he had given us, that we would be able to buy the land and that they would be a part of it. And so he went out, he was back within 30 minutes. He, he had this big bag of dirt and I said, wait a minute, you, you, that was really fast. And he said, yeah, you know, I just dug it up really quick. It was really easy and then brought it back. And I said, well, I went out there last week and it took me 30 minutes to get through all the brush and the wetlands was there at first and you had to walk through that and it was so muddy. I, it took me 30 minutes to get through all the thicket and he said, oh no, I, I just, we just parked right on Gosling there and stepped off the curb and just started digging. And I said, that's where they're building a gas station in the future, that's not our land. It's a gas station it's, and it's the most blessed gas station in the Woodlands area. It's been prayed over by the whole church, God bless this land. And I was like, oh man, and there wasn't time, the banquet was the next day, and I said, okay, okay, we'll go with that. I'll just, uh, I'll just say, hey guys, I'm giving you a vial of land that is really close to the land that God wants to, we're so close, so close. You can almost see our land from this land, pray over that land, that it will then translate into the other land. I, we're just gonna go for it, you know, it's land from around there, that's great. So at the banquet, you know, I shared with them all about the land and how we all could sacrifice to make a difference and to get this land. And, and, and then I said, in this vial right here at your table, everyone has a vial, hold that up because this is a vial of dirt from land, around the land. And, we, and I want you just to thank God and pray, remind you to pray. And then as soon as I said that, there was just this gasp from all over the banquet hall. And somebody said, I poured that on my salad. I thought it was pepper. And then all these other people start saying, half of the people, no, I'm not lying, half the people had eaten the land. <laughs> they had eaten the land that wasn't even our land. They thought it was pepper for the salad. It was right next to the salt. It was a debacle. And then God used all of us to get the land, the miracle of God. God uses dumb people, I want you to know. Ridiculous faith. God used ordinary people to do extraordinary things. I found God uses ordinary imperfect people because that's all he has to work with. And then he gets the glory and the credit. So don't be afraid to stand out and reflect God's greatness. That's what happened with David. He stepped forward to face Goliath and Goliath said, I'm gonna feed you to the birds. And Goliath was incensed that they would send out a teenager with no armor to face him. And here's what David says, 1 Samuel 17, 45. David replied to the Philistine, you come to me with sword, spear, and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Today the Lord will conquer you and I will kill you and cut off your head. Then I will give the dead bodies of your men to the birds and wild animals and the whole world will know that there's a God in Israel. And everyone assembled here will know that the Lord rescues his people but not with sword and spear. This is the Lord's battle and he will give you to us. I love that that ordinary teenager had an extraordinary faith in God 
because he knew he had an extraordinary God. So he tells Goliath, okay, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna kill you, then I'm gonna cut off your head, then we're going to kill everyone in your army, we're gonna feed their bodies to the birds, that's how it's going. That's what's gonna happen because you defied the Lord of heaven, and the Lord of heaven is in my life, and he's going to show everyone that he is God for his glory. Don't you know that God loved that? Don't you know that your God loves it when you step out and face giants knowing that he's gonna win the victory? He was able to speak those words because his faith had already been built when he faced the lion and the bear and how God had come through over and over again as he kept stepping out in faith. And the only way we're gonna slay the giant of hopelessness is by proclaiming the hope in Christ, by proclaiming loudly, never quieting down, never watering down the gospel, but proclaiming it boldly with all our hearts. In Romans 1.16, Paul says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power that brings salvation to everyone who believes. Woodland Church will never be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we believe the only way we're gonna slay the giant of hopelessness that pervades this next generation is with the gospel of hope. Gospel means good news. So we're not gonna preach the gospel of hate, we're gonna preach the gospel of hope. And the gospel of hope is this, I am a sinner, we're all sinners, but we've got a savior and he's our only hope. He's the only way. He can, he's the only one that can heal our broken hearts, our broken families, our broken nation. It's a spiritual problem. He's the only one that can heal our hearts. He's the only one that can give you purpose. He's the only one that can fill the emptiness, the God-shaped hole in your heart that nothing else can fill. And we're gonna proclaim it louder and bolder and stronger than we ever have. And when we proclaim the gospel of hope, there'll be people that call us haters. Because whenever you stand on truth, and by the way, there's no love without truth, but it has to be truth and love, truth and love. That's Jesus. He would share the truth, but it was all about love. Hey, we're all in the same boat. We're all broken. We all need to come to him. But we're building our lives on God's word. And whenever you preach the gospel of hope, there are people that say, hey, you're a hater. No, we love them. We're gonna love everybody, but there is no hope without Jesus Christ. You see, we have the God of hope, and that's why there's no such thing as a hopeless case or a lost cause, because he's the God of the second chance. And we will not water it down because it's the blood of Jesus Christ from the cross of Jesus Christ that's our only hope. It's not self-help, it's we're self-helpless. But when we turn to him and his grace, he gives us strength and his power. That's the great news. And we're gonna preach the hope in Jesus Christ. But we won't shut up. We won't sit down. We're gonna say it louder than ever before that he's our only hope, that God's word is true, the only thing you can build a life on. John three sixteen. for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. What a powerful statement. God loves the world. And so whoever, doesn't matter, doesn't matter what your background is, doesn't matter what your nationality is, doesn't matter what your socioeconomic level is, whoever, whoever, doesn't matter how far you've gone from God, how much you've sinned or what your sins are, whoever, whoever comes to him, he'll forgive and bring you to heaven one day because he doesn't want anyone to perish. And so don't be afraid in your defining moment to stand for a cause that's greater than yourself, the cross of Christ, the ground's level at the foot of the cross. The only way to do something with your one and only life that stands for all eternity is you have to move beyond yourself and slay the giant of materialism through giving. That's it. That's why I'm so proud of this next generation of our church. All of these thousands of kids that have come to Christ are following Christ, and over the next month, we're gonna see a tidal wave of generosity through our believe and build vision, and we're gonna see God do amazing things as we step up to give over and above our regular tithes and offerings to believe and build. There's so many amazing things that we're gonna be doing. We've already started building our downtown campus. It's gonna be a beautiful campus, and we don't have the money for it, by the way, but we're, we're started building it, and we're building it, and I think it's $12 million for the campus, and our, what we're gonna be doing is reaching out to everyone in Houston with all ministries and missions, making such an impact. And so that's part of it. Then also we're gonna be, and these 125 acres, we have 50 acres left. You probably didn't know that. And we've been praying about what God wants us to do with it. And right now we're gonna build ball fields. 
we're gonna build some beautiful soccer fields, baseball fields, softball fields, because we want to start all these kids leagues that are based around Christ. And so we want all these kids to come in here and play sports and be in their little league. And they have a coach that loves Jesus and they can see what that means. And they have a little devotional right before the, the game. It's competitive, but it's, it's all built around God and God's love and getting these kids and helping families. And then we're gonna reach men and women through softball and, and basketball and all the sports leagues. We're gonna start doing all that, but it costs a lot. It costs several million dollars to build all these fields. And, but it's so important because when you reach a man that doesn't know Jesus Christ, that changes this whole family and that changes generations. You get the man to church, most men think church is boring. You get a man who doesn't know Jesus to church and God gets a hold of his life. You see, that's the real problem in our society today. There's so many men that aren't stepping up. So many of us guys aren't stepping up to lead our families in Jesus. And, but when a man comes to Christ, starts growing in Christ, and I'll tell you what reaches them a lot of times is just the things that they like to do already. And so we're gonna start all these sports ministries for men and women for children, for teenagers, and that's gonna be all about reaching families for Jesus. We may even start pickleball. I'm about to give in. I'm about to give in on pickleball. Pickleball, that old man sport. So, and then we're going to rebuild the student buildings over here that need it desperately. We're gonna put millions of dollars into the student buildings and at both of our campuses, millions of dollars to revamp, to rebuild, all about children, all about students, all about missions, all about reaching out, and by the way, the first thing we're gonna do in that student building is we're gonna get rid of the smell, okay? Get rid of the smell. That thing's like, that, the metal buildings are like 20 years old. It's time, you know, and, and we can't wait to do these things, but it's gonna cost a lot. But what I'm asking you to do, and you got a little card in front of you, is I want you sometime over the next couple of weeks to pray with your family of what you could give over and above your regular tithes and offerings for our Believe and Build vision. And we'll be explaining more about it, but you can give today. Our official giving day is the second weekend of December, but it doesn't matter, you can give any time, but let it be something sacrificial over and above and make it to your commitment. That's not a pledge, no one's gonna hold you accountable for that, but just say, God, what could you do in my life? How could you bless my life? If, if Would you provide for me so I could do this over the next two years and then give a one-time gift over and above your regular tithes and offerings? for Believe and Build, for our Believe and Build vision, which is gonna make such a difference in so many lives in our area and around the world. Several teenagers shared this week on video what God's done in their life through Woodlands Church. And I just want you to hear their stories because they're giant killers. We have thousands of Davids that are growing up and I can't wait to see what God does through them if we stand and support them and we encourage them and we are an example to show them. Just watch. Freshman year in high school, I saw myself starting to like realize church as a chore. Do I really wanna do it? Do I really wanna sit through all this? And my dad would tell me, I want you to actually sit down and listen during church and see if you could take away anything from that. I actually listened to my dad for once and I sat down and listened and I realized, okay, he's actually with me. Just because I don't see him doesn't mean he's not with me. Now it's me and God in this journey. Church is fun. like. It's not a chore anymore, it's fun. Having a relationship with God is fun. Like, that's the only way to grow. It had been a while since I'd been to church and I walked in and I was immediately greeted with such affection and like I was already like a member of the church and I had never stepped foot in it. It was just like, wow, like this is a church that really cares about its students and people that aren't even their students yet. I officially gave my life to Christ at Beach Week 2022 and Mark Miller preached one night about following the nudge. And as I was on my knees, like with my arms up praying, I felt like a nudge in my heart. And he said, you're going to be in ministry. And that was like, whoa. Ever since I've been here, it's nonstop growth. I started coming to the student ministry in seventh grade. I started getting super connected with all my pastors, kind of came out of my shell a little and made a lot of friends within the church. And then come eighth grade, got introduced to alcohol for the first time, um, substances, parties, guys, all of that kind of stuff. All of those kind of just snowballed into just rock bottom for me. My isolation became so bad. 
that I, I couldn't even like get up to go to church. This past Beach Week 2023, I was not going to come. I just, I just had this gut feeling like I've fallen so far, I need to come back. There was never a moment at Beach Week that I didn't feel connected to God. Everyone was just so welcoming and open, being genuinely open and honest with people who accept me and didn't judge me and also are trying to grow in their relationship with the Lord was life-changing. All of the burdens and weights and everything I'd been carrying for so long, I was just able to finally lay it all down to God. It was the best beach week ever. One of my closest friends, um, he didn't really go to church that much and I actually invited him to church and he actually came to my surprise. And man, I'm glad I invited him. The way he's growing in his spiritual faith, I really love it. Church is the place to be. That's like, I can't emphasize that anymore, that church is the place to be. I finally followed the nudge, finally committed. And I was like, all right, like I'll do it. And I tried out for the worship team. I sang in J-High, and it's been just such a blessing. The fact that I can help students, even just one student, connect to God in the same way that I do through music, like, it's just like, what a blessing. I think that the reason the student ministry is so powerful is just because of the immense love that is given. Like, you can just see it radiating off of every single person in the student ministry. The biggest reason I love the student ministry is because of the people. If you've messed up, if you're here all the time, if you're barely ever here, you're loved. There are so many lives that have been and are currently being changed today. Um, I myself am one of them and I would be a completely different person without the Woodlands Church. I don't know <laughs> what I would do without this church. Um, I honestly probably would not be here. The student ministry, I feel like, has really developed me into who I am right now. I want to see the student ministry grow as far as every aspect, because this is where it all starts. When you're young, that's where everything starts. That's where you build your habits. So this is where everything starts. Wow. Talk about, talk about preaching. And I just really challenge you, take this card, go home and pray about it. Ask the Lord to show you what you and your family should give. We always involved our kids in these things, and I really encourage you to do that. And there's a place that says, my one-time gift, and then there's the two-year commitment. And that's just a journey with God. No one's holding you accountable for that, but just see what God does. But make sure it's a sacrifice, something that makes a difference. That's what it's gonna take if this generation is gonna make it and change the world. And you can go online here, the Believe and Build. You get the QR code, and it tells you how you can give online and sign up with your commitment online. You just click that, and then it goes right to, we commit to give. That's not taken out of accounts or anything. That's not, you're not held accountable for that. Just, just pray about it. And then also give your one-time gift over and above your regular giving. Well, now it is time for us to give to the Lord and our offering. And so it's our regular offering, and we give because we love God. How do you do it? You can go to wc.org slash give. You could do your Believe and Build now if you want or just your regular offering. You can also text the word give WC to 77977 on your phone and give right there. You can give stocks, assets. You can give in many different ways, but give because you love Jesus and you love what he's doing through the ministries of this church. Our ushers are gonna come forward now and take our offering. And as they do, I've got some great things to tell you about. Christmas Eve is around the corner. And we've been planning on this one for quite some time as well. But what's next weekend is the anniversary services. And we've been planning on this for a long time and our creative team pulling out all the stops. And it's all about faith, hope, and love and how to build faith, hope, and love into your life. What God has done and what he's getting ready to do. To build in your life, faith, hope, and love. Those eternal values that make all the difference in our lives. So don't miss it next weekend as we celebrate. And then the Festival of Light starts, uh, I think it's right after Thanksgiving, as we've teamed up with the company that does the zoo lights. How many of you guys have ever been to zoo lights down at the zoo? They're awesome. Well, now we have uh, the same companies teamed up with us and we're doing a big zoo light thing here, but we got to design all of the features. And so 
ours is going to be fun for the kids and all that, and Christmas Eve, but it's a walk all around the campus that takes you through the story of Christmas, the real story of Christmas. And we're doing it uh, just to make a difference in lives and to really show people what Christmas is all about, that there'll be thousands coming through here, so you got to get tickets this year. All the free stuff is out there, but the tickets are just minimal, and they help us just, you know, seek to break even on it. But I, I, I want you to get tickets before they get taken up, because only a certain amount can go through each night and each hour, and so you can go online on our website and get your tickets, invite friends, it's just an outreach to the community of Festival of Lights. Well, let's stand, Will and Church, because when we're built on the foundation of Jesus Christ, the wind and the waves will hit, the storms will hit you and hit this generation, but I'm telling you, it can never, God will never fail. The foundation won't be faulty. And Woodlands Worship just released a brand new song, Wind and the Waves, that we've been singing, and it's amazing, and now other churches have it, and others can, you can download it and all the, the platforms, but I love this song, The Wind and the Waves, and let's sing it because we need to realize there's storms out there. There's storms, but we have a God who's greater than any storm. The wind and the waves will hit, but when we're built on Jesus Christ, we'll never fail. Love never fails. This church will never fail. God will never fail you when you're based and built on his truth and his love. So let's sing it together. The wind and the waves. When I'm up, when I'm down, you are steady. When I'm stuck in the clouds, when it's heavy. And with talk in your heart and my question. Never love me alone in my trenches. When I'm up and I'm down. You don't leave me alone in the trenches. If you say be still, Jesus, I will. I'm standing with the Prince of Peace. If you tell my soul, trust in me.
Church family, we love you guys. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. We hope to see you next week. We love y'all. Have a great rest of your weekend. We'll see you soon.